Welcome to the Livy In Podcast, a show that helps successful real estate teams accelerate their growth and impact. Livy In, love how you live in all aspects of life. All right, so this week I'm with Scott Trembley, and Scott, uh, you were on a highly effective team in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, where is it fair for me to say kind of your, um, your calling card is highly productive agents um, that significantly out see, out, uh, outperform the industry from right. a per yep. agent production basis? Yes, sir. Absolutely. How else would you describe yourself? Um, just, you know, we, the business wise, we, we build a business based on conversion productivity. Uh, we, we do talk about love and results. And so we have, a, okay. we, have a, we have a really incredible culture that cares a lot about our folks. But one thing that we care a lot about as well is them producing the results that they want in their life, okay. right? And then, and then the big why behind each individual, like what really motivates them. So um, yeah, that caring side, that production side and bringing it all together and creating the culture of uh, it's fun, it's lively, it's energetic, it's productive though. And then what does all that look like? I see a lot of leaders struggle with figuring out the, the break point or where to divide caring about people and caring about their results. How do you navigate that, that line between I love you and you have to sell something? Right. It's a fine line, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we do, we talk about the love and results all the time. And, um, and I always share this, you can have a business that runs strictly off of love. Okay. Like, like just strictly off of love, you love everybody, you're doing all these fun stuff, but there's no results in that business will go out of business. Yeah. And then you can have a business that runs 100% off of results, mm -hmm. right? Very, very driven, very result driven, very numbers driven, all this is good stuff, but the folks really don't understand that you care about them. Mm -hmm. And so in that business will sustain for a bit, may or may not run out and may, may kind of run some people into the ground, right? So you got to find that balance. And we just, first of all, one of the things it starts with is finding the right people. So finding the right people for your organization that fit the model that you want to, um, that you want to, you know, that your mission and vision is moving forward. Um, and when you do, you've got to truly get to understand the individual personalities, like what really makes them tick, right? And understand their big why, what drives them. Also, or is it an allotment? So that's amazing. And then, of course, you've got to sort of share the vision of the company. Make sure you have an agreement from the start that you're in alignment to actually serve each other, right? And hold each other accountable to a bigger and better life. And when you do, then, because we always ask everybody, um, are you okay with us holding you accountable to that amazing life you just laid out for us? And, um, and so when you do that on the front end, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of one of the statements I love to live by. If you do the harder things up front, yeah. it gets easier down the road, yeah. right? You do the easier things up front, as you know, it gets much tougher. Do people act, do, do you find that there's no, there's a gap oftentimes between audio and video? Someone says, yes, I want you to hold me accountable. And then when you, when you go to do accountability, there's, there's a breakdown. Uh, the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's the root of that or the cause of that, you think? You know, I mean, um, honestly, I think, I think, I believe the cause of it is, is it's kind of like in, in a sales consultation, you know, yeah. a buyer or a seller asking all the right questions up front and setting the right expectations. Yeah. And I think, I think sometimes we as leaders, we get so enamored or excited about feeling good that we have this right person and yeah. we don't slow down yeah. to ask more questions and set the right expectations on the front end. But we, we hear, mm -hmm. oh yeah, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that. But, but and we're so excited, this, I think this person's cool, they fit the bill. Yeah. But we didn't just take that extra meeting with them, that extra lunch, that extra breakfast, meet their spouse to make sure that they're all in. Okay. And um, which is, which yeah, is- Yeah, tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that we do now that we didn't do before yeah. was when we bring somebody on the team, we, we know it's all encompassing to like this. It's a, it's a lot of hard work and, um, you got to put a lot of hard work, a lot of energy, a lot of passion in what you do in real estate. Right. And so what we found was we might have a, a, a team member that's all in, but behind the scenes, their husband or wife or what have you 
was not. Yeah. And so we made a decision a while back, probably about a year ago, that we have lunch or dinner with husband and wife. Okay. Right. They can bring their kids. You know. Yeah. You know, we're we're big families. We love our kids. All about our kids. Um, bring the whole family, whatever, but we want to get to know and make sure that the family is bought in to what they're getting ready to embark on. That's been a game changer. Has everybody been open-minded to that? Or is there anyone who's like pushes back on bringing spouse or trying to align schedules or anything like that? Well, uh, in terms of, in terms of every while you're, yeah, while you're interviewing. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things is, uh, here, here's what you'll find out is when you, say, you know, Eric, it's really important that, you know, mm -hmm. this is amazing, let's yeah. get together, that we meet your wife, and, and you look at me like, nah, I don't think that, I mean, I think, I'm think i thinking good. That tells me a that lot. That tells me yeah. a lot right there. Yeah, it does, right? yeah. And I know you'd be different, right? Oh, and yeah, I know you and course. I both, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about it, like, when we, we enrolled Hudson in school, and before they would agree to accept him, they had to interview us as parents. Right. And we willingly agreed to that, of right. course, because we wanted the outcome, which yes. was the best environment for our child, right? And right. so it does tell you a lot if someone pushes back on that. Right. Uh, what do you find um, you, you learn or discover in having that, that dinner meeting or that meeting with, with the spouse? Well, I'll tell you, it's, it's as in a relationship that you're getting ready to embark on with this young man or young woman or what have you, it's, it needs to be, you need to be in alignment, expectations need to be clear, you need to be yeah. on the same page, you need to have the same sort of visions. And what you find is, is do they? Are they on the same page? Is this something that Joe just came up with and hadn't even told his wife Sue yet? Mm -hmm. Have they been talking about this for two years and planned for it? That's a different game than, well, I just thought about it. My buddy said, yeah. I need to go Get talk to Scott yeah. and his group or whatever. So are they on the same page? Have they planned for it? Um, and or like, is there any, like when you start having those conversations, you can, you know, those of us that have been in the business for a bit, I've done a lot of NLP training, this, yeah. that, and the other, but you can see body languages. You can, you can see everything about, as soon as you start talking about this, is the husband and wife like energetic and excited or they're like, shutting down okay right so are they you just, in alignment with each other yeah yeah okay um it's so it's fascinating that you uh, you're actually the first team that i've talked to that says that they 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 get the spouse involved in the, right. in the process i i hired someone into a leadership position and i moved them across the country yeah and um career visioning we went through all the steps everything right. was great i'm yeah. like i i nailed this hire this right. is awesome yeah and uh, moved him across country, went to dinner with, uh, with the hire and, and spouse. And 15 minutes in, maybe, I was like, oh, I made the wrong hire the big wrong. time. <laughs> just brought him across country. Yeah. 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 And they just moved. And I'm yeah. like, now what do I do? Right. Right. And it, if, now in that case, there's, there's, a, there's a distance gap. Right. Right. And, uh, but if we had done that beforehand, I would have seen a much different person or a much different situation show up that yeah. I could have avoided wrecking someone's travel and, right. and, and hiring and, and really uprooting someone's life. So I love that extra step. It also tells me how committed someone is to aligning their schedule and doing whatever it takes to get on the same page to, to be able to do that um, after hours. So yep. um, that's awesome. Right now, I know you guys have hired, um, you know, kind of have added a good chunk of agents uh, recently and, and they're going through onboarding or 30, 60, 90 within the company. Right. What do you think the, um, what's the success trajectory look like for them? Do what, well, 100%, are you expecting 100% of agents will, will be successful to get out of that 30, 60, 90, or do you have, um, a target that you typically find from a, um, per agent production standpoint after 90 days? Yeah. So we, um, it's funny. I remember Gary, you know, Gary Keller and I talked about this when I was first coming oh, yeah. into Keller Williams about um, bringing on amazing people, going through the process. And I remember he looked at me and he's like, Scott, I mean, he's told, you know, massive amounts of folks. He said, well, I'm like 50%, right? Even though okay. I think I've got it all figured out. Um, once we get them into the 30, 60, 90, once we go through the processes of meeting spouses, if they have a spouse or what have you, um, you know, typically we're, you know, I would say we probably, you know, three out of four of them make it to a next level, mm -hmm. but um, probably two, one to two of them to the top. Our top producer level is 50 plus okay. homes a year, 
right? And so, um, but, the, but we also do have a playbook for, and we've, we've, we've revamped this over time. Like once you get them in that 30, 60, 90, like their production level in the first 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and even goes as far out as the first six months. Once we hit the six month target, then that's when we turn on the three plus deals a okay. month. So and we turn that, that on from a service perspective, right? Where you're giving them a certain number of leads or a certain number of appointments is what you're saying? Well, so when you get into our organization, you have to, it's nothing's given, everything's earned. Yeah. And so to come in, you get a certain amount of appointments before you've hit a certain amount of production. Okay. But so, and you have to be, to double up the business, you've got to be on the phone in the database. Our database is about 55,000 now. Mm -hmm. So to double, like to get the amount of business from the company that this 50 deal producer would get, you need to be on the phone probably three times as much. Gotcha. Because we are, we're only going to give you, you know, up to 10 opportunities a month through our ISAs okay. until you've proven that you can get to 15. Mm -hmm. Our 50 plus deal producers, currently we have five on the team, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, like, we kind of joke, we're like, it's, it's sort of like, when they wave the white flag, okay. that's when we'll that's stop. That's the max number of yeah. appointments, but we, yeah. But we trust them, yeah. right? We trust them, and, and we don't just trust them on just what they say, we trust on their production, but their conversion. So we track all yeah. the conversions, um, but yeah, we, we're like, I mean, we'll give them, it, if they're converting at the level that we want, then um, they You're a just, capitalist, you give them whatever right. you can close. Yeah, yeah. right, of course. you're closing business, man, and yeah. I'm just yeah. gonna keep giving them to you until you say, Scott, I'm good. Yeah, right? absolutely. Um, you said that maybe three out of four make it and maybe one out of two get to that that threshold of you know 50 units or something, right. which means there is some fallout. Yep. And uh, there's gonna be some agents that join and, and leave like right. every other real estate team. I, you know, I've had this question um, posed to me recently and. Um, and I know that you've experienced it as well, which is how do you make peace with the fact that agents leave your team? Yeah. That's so funny. Um, over time, that question's always asked, you know, cause we, we give tons of advice that are like, be a better leader, Scott, right. or offer better value, right. Scott, right, right, and right. all these other things. And the reality is some people will, and some people won't. Bottom line. And I've had, I've had to, I've had to actually make really make a lot of peace with the fact that, um, we'll bring folks in, uh, we'll pour everything into them. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we'll pour, you know, all the, all the coaching, all the training, all the systems pour into their life. They will, uh, they will become better human beings. They will become much more productive. And then, um, somebody, somebody out there says, you know, the grass is greener and they got it figured out. And the next thing you know, one day everything's all rosy. Next thing you know, they're leaving. Um, it's just, you know, you know, my, my mom ran businesses growing up and what have you, and she'd always tell me, she's like, you know, you just, if you bring them on, if you bring them into your world, right, you made a decision at that mm -hmm. point to bring them into your world. So you made that decision. So you're making a decision to pour into their lives. You're making a decision to build up their lives. Some, sometimes they're going to make a decision to go try it on their own or do something else. And you've got to just know that's part of it. And you have to celebrate that for them. And so I, good news is that was kind of instilled in me. The ones that are in my world, they always joke. They're like, the, the joke is, is I don't hold on to anything. Okay. Like that, that's always a joke. And, and, it's like, and it's like, was it always that way though? You know, like if you think back to the first person who was talented, who no, left, it wasn't always, no, okay. no, it wasn't always that way. What was that like? It just hurt. Yeah. It just hurt. Yeah. It just hurt. Yeah. I mean, I have some, Eric, I'm sure you're probably the same as, there's some along the way that were almost like my sons or daughters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and, and everybody knew it. Mm -hmm. And I've had, I've had folks come and, and you know, and, and say, Scott, could I please work with you and have, you know, me train you? And if you look at their track record over the past two years, they've sold three homes. And, and okay, sounds great. You know, so we have the meetings, this, that, and the other, get on, get in alignment. You know, 18 months later, they're doing 50 plus homes. Yeah. And then next thing you know, they forgot they were doing three. Two they forgot ago. they were doing three. Yeah, yeah. And those, yeah. So that hurt, mm -hmm. and uh, and it has hurt. Um, I'm much more. Uh, one of our core values is resilient, so maybe okay. resilient to it. Yeah. Um, but I'm just, you know, it's kind of like, um, almost like the higher power. It's like celebrate the fact that you were able to change their life at mm -hmm. that time, right? And maybe, maybe 
you know, let them go try to figure it out. Most of the time, I'm just, most of the time, it's just a fact, um, the ones that try it, their trajectory goes down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I mean, and you can't be attached to that either. And of you course. can't, and you can't let that like get your head too big either or anything. Yeah, yeah. Right. You just got to be very, um, you know, three of the words, uh, whatever that book was, but hungry, humble, and smart. Yeah. You know, we, we talk about hungry, humble, and smart all the time. Humble's in the middle. So has it gotten easier then for you to uh, exit a business partnership with people over time where like the first time really hurts, right? Really hurts. Uh, I mean, I really hurts. I, I, I I, jo- I think I was telling someone last night, I was like, I remember the first, the first two and that I felt like I had a depression hangover for a couple weeks and then <laughs> really now I'm just, and now it's just, it is how, how, how long, uh, for a new leader who's building uh, a, a business that want, they want it to look like yours. How many times did, did someone have to leave for you to get it, get adjusted to it? Gosh, I mean, you know, I probably say Eric, I mean, it, I don't know the number exactly. Yeah. Maybe, maybe five, six, seven times. Okay. I'm not because like I'm being yeah. honest. Like, yeah, it the first one hurt, and, the, yeah. and and the next few hurt. You know, probably started lessening a little <laughs> yeah. bit, but I think um, probably cut from the same cloth in terms of every single time. And these are life lessons, and we do it. We do it today. Like, yeah, what we do well, what we learn from it. Mm-hmm. What can we do better? No matter what their situation, they could have left on amazing terms or they could have left on not so good terms. But what did we do well? What did we miss? Right. What can we learn from it? What can we do better? And um, just looking at everything, you know, our business, our personal, our people like that and um, not being attached to the end result. What do you find that um, that you've done better through that trajectory? Is there is there something now that you feel like you're executing on a level 10 with or? or, you know, a nine right. um, or better than ever? Um, I would say, I think you and I were talking earlier just for a couple minutes before this, I would say a lot of times building this business, folks would come in and be so attached oh, yeah. to me and to the emotions of that. Mm-hmm. And so, which would be very energetic, very inspiring, um, the whole nine yards. But then if I made a mistake, which I make plenty of them, right? <laughs> yeah then all of a sudden it could go sideways because I was put in like this perfect limelight or what have mm-hmm. you. So what I've learned is just continue, like we talk about a lot in any conferences or whatever we are and around amazing leaders, continue to build up amazing leaders around you, which we've done an incredible job with, with team leaders, with director of growth, with operations directors, with lead ISAs, and they're leading from the front now right and the expectations are getting much clearer throughout the whole organization there's more alignment and it's not just all on me having to bring that emotional and also that logical like um you know energy to them Mm -hmm. every single day and they're not as attached to that and it just seems like it's more of a cohesive unit i hear people fall in love with the prophet not with the actual religion or or your you know mission yeah um you know, we hear people talk about they have to build up leaders all the time and that, you know, you've got to have other leaders within the organization. Tactically, what does that look like? <laughs> Shoot. Uh, part of it is, is, first of all, we love leaders that have shown that, one, they can produce in whatever world that they're in or whatever lane that they're in. Yeah. Two, they have to, tactically, they have to actually want that leadership role and, and throughout time show you that they're they, they've been leading already and helping others okay. and serving others and so you've got you got to you got to see that and then it goes it just it, it just goes back to slowing down for a minute and spending that time with that leader and really getting clear the vision the mission what they want what the company wants are we in alignment how this would work what's their thoughts about leadership how would they go about this process you know, continue to coach them to, to that, to their passions. But a fail that I've had and I've seen, and I've actually done is pushing folks into leadership roles that really aren't cut out for it or don't really want it. But yet, because you're the owner and CEO, they say yes to it. Yeah. And you find out like, 
that was a fellow. I just I wasn't I didn't slow down enough to listen that that really wasn't what they wanted to do. So then how did you know that the current leaders that you have in the organization wanted that leadership role and then were capable? <clears throat> so ask a lot of questions. Yeah. Ask a lot of questions. Watched and observed over time too the level of leadership that they were providing without even like being in that position, like just leading by example. So they had no title necessarily, no responsibility or no pay, but they yep. were they were forcing their own growth or forcing themselves into a leadership position because they were taking on more responsibility? Taking on more responsibility, yes. More ownership in terms of helping build the company, okay. build different ta tactics in the company, build different automations in the company, mm -hmm. service levels, we call it six star service. Also, their production continues to go up. They follow the playbook more yeah. more than others, and 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 they're, you know, they're very well respected yeah. in the company. You know, when we were, gosh, man, it's been I don't know how many months ago we were having a conversation. And I think I told you I was like, there are very few people that I find that that I believe tactically know how to run a real estate team right. and and can tangibly lay out the playbook for that. Yeah, um, and and you're one of them, and. Uh, one of the challenges can be then is you you know at a, at a high level and a granular level what a team should look like right and and what what switches and levers to, to throw at any given time how do you get out of the way in order to help other leaders grow when you know what they should and shouldn't do and what will and won't work that's just a that might be your best question yet so far <laughs> that was a really good one <laughs> No, it's, it's, we talk about it all the time. And a uh, matter of fact, we've been talking about it, um, you know, as we've been up here in Vermont, is I've got to, you know, drivers like us, it's mm -hmm. very easy for us to keep stepping in, keep stepping in and helping solve problems. Getting out of the way is really, first of all, you got to identify those leaders and then you have to step back and let them win and let them fail yeah. and be 100% okay with it. Like not 99 a hundred percent okay and actually award and celebrate the failures you should be celebrating the wins right yeah of but course of course celebrating the failures and i've just continued to step back more and mm -hmm. more and more and let our leaders continue to push the ball fail forward right win more often one of our one of our things is um we're excited that we're bringing on agents to the team and for the first time this has happened over like the last eight to ten months or twelve months Sometimes I never even meet them. Okay. They're, 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 yeah. they're a new team member starting Monday and I've yeah. never met them because they go through the process. We meet the spouse. And when I say mm -hmm. we, we as our director of growth, they meet our team leaders, they meet the agents, anybody. And so we go through the whole process and I just trust that we've built this thing the way it needs to be built. Yeah. The leaders, they, they understand like the profile, right? Mm -hmm. They understand the expectations, how to get in alignment and just stepping out of the way and trusting it. And it's just, it's just, it's sometimes hard for us, you know, but they, they be and my team are like, Scott, go build bigger things for us. Okay. Go build bigger. And, okay. And, and they're excited about that. So then you've got an ISA who, um, you know, Travis, who has a ton of upside and promise and right. leadership. Um, and from a proficiency standpoint, is probably one of the best ISAs in the country. Right. And, yeah. um, and we were on a call the other day and, and he was showing his, uh, you know, his like mission control center of right. yeah. all the all the bells and whistles and spreadsheets. Like Jedi and, Central, yeah, yeah. This, you know, this giant like Grand Central Station right. of of systems and processes. Yeah. What's your role then as a leader um, in in either helping to cast that vision or help him build that? What's your role in helping Travis become? Uh, a massive portion of growth when someone's really highly talented like he is right at that role yeah what what role do you play in that so Travis and I stay really connected we actually meet on the weekly uh, we might be moving that to bi-weekly because we brought in some more leaders but um, it's very important for us to, to 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 stay connected I'll never forget Travis came in you know we first got going he was like um, he's that coach I got all, they call you coach right they, they call me coach yeah yeah he's like coach I got all these massive screens and I want to bring in my computer and I want to, I want to create this like, you know, this, this darn rocket ship that's going to go yeah. to the moon. Are we okay with that? I'm like, I said, dude, absolutely. If that's what's going to make you convert at a high level and distribute, I'm saying 100%. So you need to put it all together. Um, but Travis, what I found in him, and this came from just really, really, really listening to him and learning more. 
He's very, very big on culture. He's very, okay. very big on serving. And he's also got leadership that's just oozing out of him. And he didn't before in the previous Travis, yeah. not knocking anybody or what have you, but yeah. he just wasn't able to release that. Okay. And so we, we've just been finding like with Travis, what truly inspires him and what inspires him. Of course, he's, he closes massive business as yeah. an ISA. But what inspires them is, is to get other ISAs to do the same and to automate. Got it. So just giving him, just literally giving him ownership, ownership right of it. Yeah. Yet, by, like, but really trusting them. Like yeah. he loves the fact that I really trust his vision as well. I trust what he's doing. And I just help, you know, tweak things along the way, but just give him the autonomy to take ownership. So you're coaching go. him as a person more than anything, yep. probably than coaching the execution of, right. of the actual day-to-day -day processes. It's funny, I asked him um, about jumping in having a conversation while we were here, and he yeah. said, uh, sorry, I can't make it. I have 30 more appointments to set. <laughs> this month. I could totally see right. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I was like, all right, all right you, yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Like, That's a Trav answer for sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I'm like, I don't know too many other people that are like, Hey, sorry, can't make the event. Right. Got, got a, I got a uh, series of appointments. I got a book still. He, he's a killer man. And he, uh, and one thing we do, is he loves me helping him run a business too. Okay. He loves me helping him run a business. And so the more like he's running that ISA business, automation business. Mm -hmm. And then like, you know, right now we're building out a coaching program. Yep. And I said, coach. And so I'm helping him build that business model and build that business so then Travis can just show up and do his thing and be inspirational, automate things for folks and actually teach them how to convert, script, dialogues, the whole nine yards. Um, so it's just, I mean, he's just an amazing young man. It's a lot of fun to work with. I think the ISA division is the hardest thing to do uh, in scale right. and, uh, and then you know, duplicate it. Sometimes you can do it with, uh, you know, one or two talented people, but getting it to be main, uh, sustainable, it can yeah. be a challenge and be profitable. Right. What have you learned in, in making an ISA division profitable and effective? It's another great question. Um, the, uh, a lot of folks will say that you, you don't make any money with an ISA yeah, team, yeah, yeah. right? And, and so I'm not interested in doing anything that's not profitable. Okay. I do talk Me about neither. We do talk about two words, impact and profit. You can have yeah. both, just get the order right. So yeah. impact first, profit comes. But um, <clears throat> accountability. So, I mean, you've got to have, first of all, you've got to have the right leader. But then accountability is ISAs to agents. A lot of teams that I've found across the country, they, um, their agents kind of, I mean, this, it is what it is, kind of look down like the ISAs are just working yeah. for them. Yeah. Yeah. And the culture and accountability is not the way it should be. We're all, we work all together. If you ask anybody in our company, we'd probably all say we work for the ISAs. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's that type of humility. How did humility. you create that? It took time. It, it, took, okay. it, it took time. It took trust and it took um, measurements and what have you. And, but our tracking. But you as a leader probably have to talk. There's, there's probably, there's nuance here, I'm guessing. Yeah. Do you speak differently? Do you, do you, do you, what, what how do you show up? To, to like lift up that ISA yeah. so that the, you're reshaping the way that they feel about the ISA? Man, it's just, you know what? Um, you know, always, I got into real estate for the first word, real. Okay. Right, for the first word, real. Those that know me know it's going to be really authentic. I'm going to really care, and we're going to really do something special, and we're really going to go to the next level. Which is why so, they call you coach, probably. Probably, probably, <laughs> probably why. <laughs> yeah. But, but there's just, we just, you just, from, from hello, we just start building a lot of trust and, and it's very important for our, now, cause our ISAs are right next to our agents. And so we have okay. a prospect and we call it a wealth generating room and they're okay. all together. So it's really important for them to have a cohesive unit together. If you're right? tactically going into a meeting or you're tactically going to be sharing numbers, are you sharing ISA numbers first or agent numbers first? We've, we've, uh, it's funny. That's a great question. We flipped it. Okay. We used to show the ages. Yeah. Now we show the ISAs. Yeah. 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 This is what I wonder is in in thinking about this is like in order to have, in order to have that inversion of of almost like power dynamic. I realize it's not. I mean, it should be a a, a lateral relationship. Right. But it makes a lot more sense to have those that are more accountable and more structured um, right. be the accountability and the structure arm of right. the sales department. And so. Um, my my guess is there's a ton of nuance as to how your IS how you're empowering the ISA team to create that belief system in the organization. Yeah, well, I mean, like 
we want the ISAs holding the agents accountable yeah. all the time. Our ISAs, Trap yeah. I told you, can pull they can pull clients leads back, them, yeah. pull leads from them, pull appointments back. If they're yeah. not following up, they're not following through. We have all the automations to show it. Yeah. Right. Our, our, our agents know it. Do you ever, so, I mean, because what I hear is the IS, like, nobody has permission to take money away from the ISA. Right. 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 The agent doesn't have permission to not do their job. Right. And therefore cost the ISA their income. That's exactly right. Yeah. Most people would flip it and say the ISA, you know, the ISA doesn't have permission to take income right. from the agent. Did you ever, did you ever worry that you would lose agents because of that role reversal? Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, Maybe a little. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's a joke around there, like, coach doesn't worry about a whole lot. Okay. Like, I just, okay. but I mean, but maybe, maybe a little, it's just that um, we knew we were doing the right thing. We, yeah. we knew as we started building it. Now, let me tell you, when we first started we building it, that way, though, we, we, yeah. when we first started building it, we saw the gap. Yeah. The gap was the agents were becoming entitled and spoiled by it, right? Yeah. And they were kind of looking like, these guys work for me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and but we and we probably created that animal. Yeah. And so we just took a look at it and said, that's Un, not the way. Unbeknownst to you. Right. right. Like, I mean, and listen, I, I would do the same thing because right. it's natural. Right. right. In the evolution of the organization that you go from you're the rainmaker originally, then right. eventually you work yourself out of a job and you yeah. put an agent in to backfill you. But typically the agent gets there before the ISA does. Right. Yeah. And my guess is if the ISA was before the agent, yep. that, that power dynamic wouldn't exist. So yep. um, it's got me rethinking how a little bit of how we're structured and then how do I how do I change the language and the dynamic internally so that uh, we're we're flipping that. One thing I think to give people context uh, to understand, I mean, I think it was last month one of your ISA said that they had uh, had 17 closings. Yeah, yeah, I think it's 16 or 17. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So we're talking about like one or two right. closings from an ISA, right. uh, which to me is how you're able to do it profitably. Right. It, yeah. So, so yeah, um, you got the accountability, you got the structure, you got to have lead distribution rules. You have to have lead distribution rules. Okay. We failed with that in early on, right? <laughs> Just given like opportunities to Joe over here who. We hadn't even found that yet. Joe was not even fit for the I'm just using yeah, that yeah, yeah. not even fit for the team. So distribution rules, the accountability, and having ISAs that will step up and hold agents accountable mm-hmm. to the distribution rules, right? All of that, all of that, all of that matters. But then you have to have production metrics for your ISAs, obviously, okay. and your agents. But you know, what are those? Do you have those? We do. We, okay. Yeah. So our our agents. Well, when you get to the the um, so after six months, you have to be producing three plus, okay. three plus deals a month. Mm-hmm. That really runs for six months. Once we get them, our goal for our agents, once we get them to 12 months, we, our goal is four deals a month. Yeah. And right? what, are you, what are the ISAs, what are they accountable to results-wise? ISAs, so if they're, it's, it's very similar. After yeah. six months, they're, it's six deals okay. each. So it's right. kind of like, almost like double the yeah. number. Once they get to a year, it's double digits. How much has appreciation impacted, like home price and value appreciation impacted the profitability of the ISA department? Because, you know, I have this limiting belief sometimes that, you know, in, in middle of nowhereville, America, where I live with like $60,000 houses some right, days, it seems right. like, I'm like, it's, I can't figure out on a, how, to, how to map out the profitability of an ISA right. very well. Yeah. Um, have you noticed a trend where pricing impacts your, the profitability of your ISA department? I mean, funny enough, when I track, um, even over the last four years, yeah. when we have it working at a high level, we've maintained, and depending on the lead sources, and we fluctuate a little bit, we are heavy in Wilopo now, right? Okay. We got away from all the big portals. Um, our, so our profitability, I've always, I, I won't spend any money unless, unless it's a 5X return. Okay. So one's got to give me five or we're not going to do it. Back in the day with the portals, when I had the cost per lead down, we had that up to about six or seven X. Mm-hmm. Made a decision a couple years ago that we're going to build a massive database. We're going to be very automated. We're going to be very extremely focused on our follow-up. Is that because you had the right person or you had the right vision? A little bit both. So, so you had, did you have Travis at that time to help you? With Travis, that Travis came in after, okay. right after the fact that I made a decision to move away from that and just mm-hmm. build massive database, do the automations. Thankfully, we found Travis right up just after that. Okay. And now he's really taking it to an incredible different level. But we run, we run with our ISAs. 
um, somewhere between that six and seven X return. Yeah. It's funny, we're, for someone who's listening, we're talking about automation, we're talking about systems and processes <laughs> right. and models, right. and all the things that typically real estate or salespeople are not notoriously great at. Right. You sold a lot of houses as an individual agent as well. Yeah, yeah. Right? Um, best year was 130, <laughs> okay. yeah, 45 million by yeah. myself, yeah. 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 Uh, so how the hell do you make a gap to systems? Because I'm guessing at 130 units, you were a great salesperson, so right. then, what the hell allowed you to, to also think yeah. about automations and think about systems and processes? Just, um, you know, I had a, had a development back in the day, back in the, um, before I started this team. And um, I was finished, so I was in the new construction world, working for the developer, I had my own, I had my own brokerage company, just focused on them. And unfortunately, which is another, a whole another podcast, probably yeah. the, 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 the personal life side of it, but I had twin boys born on Christmas Day in 2010, and my wife passed away a week later. Yeah. So that 2011 was just an absolute blur, right? Mm -hmm. But so I'm moving through this community, and, and thankfully I got through it. Um, you know, boys and I are fantastic. But um, I made a decision that even through what I learned in corporate and then learned and running my own development, I made a decision that a lot of people just always say, man, you just like, um, transform yourself from one to another to go build a business and jump from the development to the, you know, the, the resale or the resale world, the general brokerage world. And so I just started studying. I just started studying, um, you know, obviously MREA yeah. and just reading that and just studying, but just studying businesses. Thankfully I have an mm. incredible mentor in my, um, my uncle who's got the largest paint contract in business in Atlanta. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a probably right now it's a, you know, net twenty twenty five million dollar company. Wow. It's massive. Yeah, but he's a he's a he's a studier of metrics and 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 um, operationalized like it's it's like it's like Jedi on steroids, yeah. right? So just made a decision that if I'm going to do this, if I'm going to flip that switch, because I was offered before I did this, I was offered to travel the United States and be the VP of sales for one of the largest private builders mm -hmm. and move to Atlanta which would have been kind of still in the leadership sales, but you know, I had the two boys and I wasn't gonna be on a plane for missed yeah. that part of their life, 32 weeks out of the year, whatever. So I just started studying the, the back end of the business. I knew I could sell something, yeah. right? And I knew I could teach people to sell. Because that was your experience with was sales? Like, yeah. Okay. So just started studying it more, running, you know, just running yeah. metrics, operationalize, understanding businesses, not just real estate. Mm -hmm. So I just got excited about building something like that okay. and just kept going. It's fascinating, right? It's like, yeah. I just love it. Yeah, yeah. it is. It's, yeah. I know it, you love it too. I so, do. Yeah, I do. Yeah. I'm like, I've never taken a business class, but this isn't, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's, it's hard, but right. the beauty of it is, is that everything that you ever want to learn is available. If you just apply yourself to learn it, everything is, and, yeah, everything is. And learning is 100% mobile, right? I mean, 100%. you can, you can learn in the shower at right. this point with waterproof headphones. Yeah. That was a question I asked you earlier. You went yeah. for a hike. I'm like, do you hike with headphones or did you hike without? Right. right. Are yeah. you learning something or are you thinking? Yeah. And, and it's about 50 50 because I mean, yeah. it's, it's, but when you're thinking, you're learning too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So, as we wrap up, I mean, I'm, I'm always fascinated with this. Um, obviously, you're, you're a leader in the space, you're a leader in the industry within, within Keller Williams, uh, within your market. Right. Uh, I'm always fascinated when, when someone who's a strong leader like yourself partners with other leaders like you've done with Livian. Yeah. What's the, what's the um, dynamic or the catalyst that caused you to, uh, as one leader, partner with other leaders. Yeah, yeah. Um, everybody's, a bunch of people asked me that this week. That's cool. You know, just, uh, you know, I got to, got connected, um, probably, th I think, I think Mia started that. But okay. Mia, I think Mia started that connection, but got connected to, uh, to Adam, started having conversations, um, really just getting to know each other, uh, I'll, you know, at a deeper level, visions of sort of what we wanted in, in life were pretty much in alignment. Uh, we did kind of agree that I didn't need Livian and Livian, Livian really didn't need me. Yeah. Um, but man, we could be a whole lot better together. And so my whole thing is the same reason why that I joined Keller Williams when I did, because yeah. we were independent, was um, mm. just sitting in the room with guys like yourself, with Adam, with Gary, um, just spending more time with like-minded leaders that want to grow something really, really special and do something amazing to impact more. Um, it's, it's, 
I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's the cliche answer or not, but that's my answer. Because, you know, the other stuff, and look, I mean, it's, it's amazing because Livian is helping even take our operational operations to another level. Yeah. But we were, we were already in that direction, building a new brand, but just really wanting to make an impact at a higher level with more amazing people. So just being surrounded by more leaders can only be, only be like better. And so I'm just, we're really excited about that.